Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining today's Estadia and MicroFocus webinar featuring Moving IBM Mainframe Workload to Azure. During the presentation, if you have any questions, feel free to type it into your chat box on your control panel, and we'll save it for the end of the presentation. We have an interesting presentation in store for you today, so let's get started. First off, we will introduce the presenters from both Estadia and MicroFocus. Next, we'll talk about the importance of why you should consider moving your IBM mainframe workload to Azure, as well as the benefits of deploying it. After that, we have a live demo in store for you so you can see the application running. Followed by that, we will have a live Q&A session. So if you have any questions, feel free to jot it down and send it over our way throughout the presentation. Finally, we will tell you about some upcoming webinars we have, as well as a special offer. You do not want to leave before the special offer. We have an exciting offer for you today. Craig's been with uh, Stadia for seven years, but before that, he was with our friends over at, at MicroFocus for over 16 years. With that, he has a combined experience of over 25 years. Craig is our leg mod guru over at Estadia, and his experience is in product pre-sales and delivery management. So we're excited to have Craig join us today. Next, we have Eddie Hewton. Eddie is the director of product management at MicroFocus. He's been with MicroFocus for over 19 years and altogether brings over 28 years of industry experience. Eddie is, his experience is, mainly lies on mainframe application mm -hmm. development, deployment, and modernization. And he does everything from concept to completion on the mainframe side. So anything from product management to service delivery to development, he, um, he's been wonderful. So Eddie, thank you for joining us today. Last but certainly not least, we have John Ullman. John is the Director of Software Development at Estadia. He has been with Estadia for over 27 years and has over 42 years of mainframe experience. And he is our mainframe guru. Normally, uh, what, not just in Estadia software development, but he, his expertise also lies in IBM mainframe as well as Unisys mainframe, uh, but anything really along the lines of distributed computing, uh, he's, he's uh, one of our top experts. So John will be showing you the demo uh, later in the presentation. So we're excited to have that. So I'm happy to hand the mic over to Craig. Craig, it's all yours. Great, thanks. Yeah, thanks Desiree. And let me add my thanks to everybody for joining us today. We really appreciate you uh, taking the time to um, to watch this presentation. Um, I'm just going to go through a little bit about uh, Astadia. Uh, you can advance to the uh, the Astadia slide, uh, Desiree. So Astadia is um, uh, we're a medium sized technology consulting group, and we focus on maximizing the impact while minimizing the risk of all the technologies that blend together today, whether it's a uh, hybrid enterprise and cloud environment, or maybe you're looking at moving everything into the cloud. So uh, we try to do the most with the least, and um, they, most clients choose us because of our experience and our agility and the fact that we deliver on uh, what we say we're going to deliver. We have three primary areas that we focus on. Um, you can see those here. We've got the develop group, and this is really around your development environment. It's helping you build out your DevOps environment, maybe improving your development processes, your testing processes, providing things like testing as a service solutions, or even outsourcing your testing um, needs to Estadia, which we, we have done in the past and still continue to do today. We also have a managed group, uh, and they are focused on managing your environment. It could be your cloud environment, it could be on-prem assets, uh, really, anything anything that needs to be managed in your IT environment, uh, we can do that for you, including help desk uh, processes and setting up uh, uh, folks to take on your help desk needs. And then, of course, my favorite group is the Migrate group, uh, near and dear to my heart, um, where we help you do um, what you need to do with your legacy applications to get them into the cloud, to get them contemporary and make the most of them. Um, 
I've added some bullet points here just to reemphasize what we do, and that is uh, we've got 90 mainframe migrations, uh, actually more than that, under our belt, both IBM and Unisys uh, on Windows, Linux, and Unix targets, and also on-prem and Azure deployments. So a little bit of everything there, and it's something that we've, we've been doing for quite some time. Uh, we got a lot of experience. Our first migration uh, we did in 1995, so it's something we're very familiar with and focusing on getting you um, into the cloud or into distributed uh, in a low risk, high payoff fashion. And now I'll head it over to Eddie to give you a snapshot of MicroFocus. Yeah, thanks, Greg, and uh, welcome, everyone. Um, so, yeah, first, what I wanted to just say uh, was a few words about MicroFocus. Um, obviously, um, we, we had a significant merger with HP uh, last year, and really that's um, allowed us to have one of the most robust portfolios of enterprise-grade software in the world, you know, across a, a range of key areas, um, which actually makes us the seventh largest pure play software company in the world. Now, today with uh, the new MicroFocus, um, we have an incredible workforce with 18,000 employees, um, supporting over 40,000 customers globally, uh, including 98 of the Fortune 100. So really, we have global scale to meet the needs of the largest enterprise and government customers. But importantly, as MicroFocus, we've kept our core, va core values. And, and I really am very delighted to work with Estadia today um, to allow uh, and really to provide the flexibility um, to allow our joint customers to take their mainframe workload into the Azure cloud. So MicroFocus um, has been providing solutions for customers with business applications on the mainframe um, for over three decades. Uh, and really we've been helping them to modernize. Um, we've been helping them to modernize business applications themselves. Now this could be to support new user requirements, to simplify or consolidate applications, or to integrate business systems into newer technologies within the systems of engagement. Uh, we help customers with the application delivery process. Now Craig mentioned that in terms of DevOps, but this is really changing how the applications are developed and released to the business, making mainframe development more agile and responsive to business need. And lastly, and, and, and perhaps you know the subject of today's uh, uh, webinar is, is really letting customers modernize the infrastructure itself by making mainframe applications and the value they provide available as workload wherever the business needs it. And that's actually uh, in the cloud. So this has allowed us over the last past over the last uh, 30 years to provide a rich set of technologies that really underpins the Stadia's ability to move your fit for purpose mainframe workload to the cloud. Now we'll be touching upon some of these capabilities a little later on in this session, um, but the enterprise solution set from MicroFocus is being used successfully by hundreds of our customers to meet their mainframe modernization challenges, you know, whether that's from application analysis to modern development tooling and processes, uh, flexible mainframe testing through to deploying mainframe applications on alternate production environments, or actually controlling and managing the development and release process through best-in-class SCCM tooling. So why are organizations looking to move workload off the mainframe and, and why are they targeting Azure for, the plat for that platform? So I think what's key to this is, is really understanding the business applications themselves. Now these have been developed you know, literally over, over decades in COBOL and PL1 uh, and these are actually running on the IBM mainframe. Now, these represent the core business systems, the systems of record, if you like, for many global enterprises, and these continue to deliver real business value. However, organizations now need to consider how they can actually exploit these on open commodity-based infrastructures, where Azure is already part of their strategy going forward. Now, compliance may be dictating that customer data needs to be stored locally in certain geographic regions so the driver becomes delivering localized customer service and equally organizations might want to actually get into new geos themselves um, and actually take those applications they have running on the mainframe today and actually spin those up in azure in those new geos um, but you know they, they want to look at Azure to do that because they can't find local mainframe skills, and that's actually causing a barrier to entry. 
Or very often organizations are just looking to repurpose those tried and trusted applications and deliver them on a much lower cost platform. Now, this is why Azure is being considered as a way of modernizing infrastructure. But Craig, is the cloud really ready for mainframe workload? Well, I think it is, yes. If uh, you go to the next slide, you'll see that uh, we have seen, uh, especially in recent years, uh, a hyperscale growth in the cloud uh, market. Um, in, in 2016, 122, uh, uh, sorry, 19 billion, and it's expected that by 2020, we'll be spending $122 billion in the cloud environment. And correlating with that, uh, in this year alone, we expect to see $43 billion spent just on managing those cloud environments, which is one of the reasons why we're in that business. Um, and then you can see that 85% of customers um, and clients of ours and uh, throughout the IT uh, environment are beyond the discovery phase and are actually doing work in the cloud. On the next slide, you'll see something that our own managing partner of clouds put together uh, that talks about the cloud adoption waves. So if you think about the first wave, when the cloud first came out and people started sort of knocking tires on it, um, they, they looked at putting their dev and test environments out there, maybe putting their websites out there, great for uh, cloud um, uh, hosting. Um, then moved on to CRMs and big data processing and marketing. And the great thing about big data was, you know, you didn't have to buy a bunch of equipment, right? You could just stand up some virtual machines in the cloud and do your data crunch. And then when you were done, you spin them down and, and you don't have a bunch of hardware sitting around. Um, then the second wave was uh, uh, some more um, critical systems like email, right? Everybody needs their email. Um, working well, backups, providing backup to uh, back up your enterprise systems or your applications. And then we moved into things like disaster recovery as a service, right? Began, began to see the value of doing that versus having a bunch of data centers and mirroring if you had an easy way to uh, uh, recover from a disaster from using the cloud, made a lot easier and a lot less expensive. And finally, we're moving into the, the period where it's, um, time to move legacy mainframe applications into the cloud where it makes sense. Um, so there's um, a, a big change coming in terms of where to run your legacy applications. On the next slide, you'll see that for Azure itself, um, over 90% of the Fortune 500 companies already run enterprise level applications in Azure, meaning they're running critical workload in Azure today. And if we've been running mainframe workload on open systems for more than 20 years, right? We did our first migration in 1995 to an, an, a Unix system. And the x86 chipsets, I mean, it's proven, they can run mainframe workload. It happens every day all around the world. And those chipsets are only getting better and faster. And when you combine that with the advent of solid state drives, which are now becoming commodity hardware, it's really uh, an even bigger boost to the performance because you're able to really uh, facilitate those heavy intensive IO operations. And then Azure itself has a worldwide network of data, sense, data centers across over 42 regions around the globe. So that is very important and um, enables uh, clustering and redundancy to make sure that your application is available at any time, anywhere. So in short, uh, the answer is yes. Yes, the main the Azure is ready for mainframe workload. Uh, we can move to the next slide now to address why Astadia and why MicroFocus. So how would you move your applications uh, to the Azure environment and why would you use MicroFocus and Astadia to do that? Next slide, please. So to start with, um, let's think about uh, the process of moving your application into Azure. It doesn't just happen magically. You don't snap your fingers and your application magically is in the cloud. So here at Estadia, we've uh, developed a process over 25 years of experience um, where we have uh, five discrete steps to get you there and then a final step to manage it. So we have what we call a transformation engine. And um, we start out by discovering your environment, getting all your code, your data, 
the software that you're using in the mainframe today, all of your development processes and the requirements that you need to do your, your work and serve your customers today. And then from that, we design an architecture, meaning all the pieces and components that need to run in the cloud, mapping all of those components into the Azure environment, designing the databases. So maybe you're going from a hierarchical database to a relational database, so that mapping has to occur. Taking a look at all the interfaces to your application and doing what you need to make those applications move over. And of course, you have some, some customizations around your application that need to be addressed as well. And then from that, all of that is fed into our transformation engine rule base, our knowledge base. And then we use that to um, automatically go through the code and start to make the changes that need to be made to make it work in the Azure environment. Now we changed as little as possible, and that has to do with low risk, right? We want to get you there with the lowest risk, lowest cost possible. So through the support from the MicroFocus tool set, we are able to make the minimum amount of change as, that's necessary. And you're usually talking about, okay, I'm not pointing to this database anymore. I'm pointing to this database in the cloud. Uh, so the changes are, are fairly minimal. And there might be some things that you need to account for, such as sorting routines that are now in ASCII instead of EBCDIC. So there are things like that. But the, the proven business logic remains unchanged. Okay. Then, of course, we go through some testing. To, uh, we compile the code. It doesn't compile. Yeah, there's a problem. We go back, take a look at it, find the problem. We find the problem, and a lot of times that problem will uh, apply to many other programs. So by doing that, you can reduce the number of errors in the future programs. Uh, so it's an iterative process where we go through and compile and test until we get it right. Um, and, and all of those, those issues that we find get fed back into the transformation engine so that uh, if any of the code needs to be uh, processed again, it pulls in those new changes. Um, and of course, we don't actually delete any code. All we do is comment out the old code, make some notations and insert the new code. So your, your uh, original code stays intact. And then after the testing is done and the application works, of course, then we take a look at doing some performance testing, making sure that if we need to, we load balance the application among multiple VMs to make sure that the performance is there, which is actually quite easy to do in a cloud environment. Um, and then move into the implementation phase where we start deploying the pieces of your application into the Azure environment. So maybe you've got static data that doesn't change. So you can deploy that ahead of time. Um, but then when you get to the cutover date, you're going to move over the dynamic data uh, during a system cutover. And then once that's done, you're going to do some, um, uh, some validation, make sure everything is working right, and then do the actual implementation cutover and move into the new system. So we've done this many times. A lot of times we do it over a holiday weekend. Um, your uh, users go home on a Friday. They come back on a Tuesday and they start up their machines, they start doing their work. The interfaces look exactly the same, if that's what you want, which usually you do. Um, and then they don't even know that they're on a distributed system running in the cloud. It just works the way it did when they went home on Friday. And it really is that simple. And of course, once this is done, you wanna set up uh, your process for managing that, manage your Azure environment, maintaining that the uh, application, making enhancements to the application. Once it gets into the cloud and you've done this low risk uh, migration into the cloud environment, then you can take your savings and start saying, you know what, I wanna change my interface. I wanna make it look nicer. I wanna integrate with mobile devices. I wanna integrate with other contemporary technologies. And when you're in the cloud, it's a lot easier to do. So let's talk about um, what it looks like in the cloud. So uh, we have developed um, our team working uh, with our Azure team, our legacy team and Azure team, um, a, a reference architecture. So on the top, what you see is your typical IBM technology stack, right? You've got an LPAR that's running ZOS and you've got some supporting software like you know, RACF, uh, other security software, you know, code versioning, things like that. But the real heart is in the, 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 the sort of light purple rectangle there. And that's where your batch programs live, your CICS programs live, 
your IMS programs live. And maybe you've got some assembler, maybe you've got some COBOL, some PL1. And of course, in that same, um, the same area, you've got your vSAM files, uh, any GDGs, and your database, right? It's probably going to be DB2, or it might be IMS, or it might be an database. Uh, database. And all of that is being accessed by your users through either a TN3270 screen through an emulator, um, or maybe you've got a custom UI that, that taps into some of this mainframe uh, functionality or some web-based application that also taps into that. So if you look down below, all you're doing is mapping those pieces into the Azure environment. And we've got what we call the mainframe cloud framework. And that mainframe cloud framework is really built on uh, the microfocus um, tool set. So you can bring your batch down, your COBOL down with very small changes. You can bring your CICS applications down. You can bring your IMS applications down, your COBOL, your PL1, your Fortran, your JCL, and your Rex. All of that comes down with very few changes. You can bring your vSAM files down uh, as they are and keep them as vSAM, or maybe you want to do something fancy like make them relational databases. That can be done as well. It's not that hard to do. And of course, your database, the DB2 database, you can uh, bring that down into something like Azure SQL. Um, if for some reason you want to stand up a virtual machine and run SQL Server, you can do that. Or maybe you want to stick with something like DB2 LUW. That, that is fine as well. All of those will work. Um, IMS, you can bring that down and either make it relational or MicroFocus even has the ability to emulate the IMS DB. So you can bring that down as well. And, and that even re reduces even further the amount of change that you have to go through. And all of this can coexist with any other applications that you want to work with those legacy technologies, such as C, C++, C Sharp, Java, um, maybe you got PowerShell scripts. Um, so all of that just comes down really nicely into the Microsoft uh, Azure VMs. Now around that, you've got things like the application load balancing, okay? So uh, we've actually found that if you replicate your application through multiple VMs and load balance that you'll get a, a very high performance more so than if you throw a bunch of processors in one instance at it. It's, it's um, and these are the kinds of things that we, the, in the performing tuning, performance tuning stage that we work with you to, to figure out. Uh, and then of course, you're still gonna have uh, scheduling software, any printing software and sorting software, uh, security through Azure AD that maps to your RACF credentials. Um, and then supporting all of that is your virtual, uh, sorry, your Visual Studio team services for code versioning, things like that, monitoring. Um, and uh, Azure storage for any blob data, any large large blobs of data that you need to save off or archive. Now, the great thing is, as I mentioned before, on the right-hand side, the, the interfaces, your, your users are going to come in exactly the way they did before. It's just they are pointing to a different source. So that's what makes this approach so uh, low risk and, and high benefit. Next slide, please. So one of the things that we often get asked is, okay, well, how do I ensure that it's available? How do I ensure that my application is there when I need it? What, what prevents me from losing work because something goes down? There is a way to achieve that. So the best way to do it, and, and it's actually kind of a no-brainer, um, you have multiple regions, uh, Azure regions. So you have your primary region, which might be, let's say, the region closest to where your users are going to be. And you set up um, the architecture in the previous slide into this region and have your application running. So that's, that's the, the, the uh, middle of this slide where you see primary region. And then you have a secondary region, which is your production DR region and failover region, which has a mirror of the application just sitting there, just waiting. And over to the left, between where you see production users and the production region, there's this little thing called the Azure Traffic Manager. And that Azure Traffic Manager is pinging these two regions, making sure that they're alive and assigning uh, and, and taking on work. And if your primary region, for some reason, stops responding, it automatically starts sending work over to your secondary region. So that is a way to make sure that you have high availability and failover support. And then you see there your um, 
SQL, uh, your uh, SQL databases and other databases have a active replication going on to make sure that they are in sync. So this is a way to address high availability. Next slide, please. So I thought it would be nice for you to have a look at how the different technologies from one side map over uh, um, to the, the cloud. So obviously your ZOS and MVS, that's your operating system on the, on the uh, mainframe, those would map over in the, into Azure. Right now, it would make the most sense in this environment to go to Windows, but if you need to, you can go to some other operating system like Linux. Uh, CICS, it maps over to CICS. Um, IMS maps over to IMS. Uh, Assembler, um, that is, that's a little different. Assembler needs to be converted, uh, needs to be converted to COBOL uh, or some other language. It actually just depends on the purpose of those Assembler programs and, and what, what, um, what feature or function they perform in your legacy application. There may be some things that those assembler programs are doing that you could get from the OS, for example. Uh, but that is uh, almost always rewritten to something else. Um, the JCL comes down into the MicroFocus JCL engine. Uh, the COBOL obviously comes over as COBOL. PO1 can come over as PO1. And the natural can come over as natural, or again, if you want to do some rationalization like what you do with the assembler, maybe it makes more sense to put everything in COBOL. But of course, you could use other languages like C Sharp and Java. Uh, there's actually a Fortran compiler for distributed, so you can even move your Fortran over. Um, Rex comes over as Rex, or you can do something in PowerShell or some other type of scripting. Uh, DB2, as I mentioned, maps over to Azure SQL, or you can choose to use uh, DB2 LUW or Oracle, if that's what you prefer. And then the IMS DB um, maps over to MicroFocus's IMS DB, but um, you may want to consider moving it to a relational database to make it a little bit easier to share with other, uh, other external technologies um, that are, are, are used to working with relational data. Um, and then, of course, vSAM comes over as vSAM or QSAM. Um, but again, some some uh, customers say, you know what, I just want to make that relational. It just makes it easier for me to share. Um, and then, of course, the GDDs comes over as GDGs. And so everything in here that has an asterisk, all of that met and maps over to the MicroFocus Enterprise Server and is provided as MicroFocus Enterprise Server, which is really what makes this such an easy uh, process. Next slide, please. So now that you've seen the architecture, we just want to talk a little bit about the tools and, and how we do this. Um, so for Stadia, um, we have been doing this, as I said, for more than 25 years. And so we've got a lot of research and development into our transformation engine. Um, now, uh, transformation engine is um, a nice name for it. We, we generally refer to it as filtering. Um, it's kind of a boring term, but that's what we use. Uh, we filter the code to filter out all of the stuff that won't work in the Azure environment, comment it out, and put in all the all the replacement code. It, this is done through a rules-based engine, uh, so it is a repeatable process. It is an iterative process, uh, and it is highly efficient. Uh, we also have a set of tools that help us with the data, moving the data over. We have a, a product line called the Stadia Data Pro, Within there, we have a file converter, which helps us convert files from one platform to another platform. DDL converter to help us convert database uh, from one type of database to another type of database. Maybe you're going from hierarchical to relational, or even if you're going from relational to relational, there's still some changes uh, from the mainframe to the distributed side that you have to take into consideration. Um, some of these tools generate extract, transform, and load programs that then once we've got the databases defined, we pull the data out from one platform and pump it into the other platform. And we also have uh, a high-speed multi-threaded parallel load system that will, uh, when you're cutting over, if you've got a lot of dynamic data that needs to be cut over within a certain window for your uh, cutover weekend, um, this tool is a, a high-speed multi-threaded uh, tool that takes the code, uh, takes the data from one um, platform, meaning DB2 or uh, IMS, and pulls it out and does all the transformation in memory and then pumps it into the new database on the distributed side. And we have multi-threaded 
have it multi-threaded because you have some data like blob data, which takes longer. So you set up these sort of slow lanes for this stuff that just has to come down at its own pace. And then you've got other data that can come down really fast, like regular text data, that's just text. So rather than slowing those databases, the tables up, you just put those in their own lanes and then you give the slower data its own lane. And we have moved, um, I don't know, 70 terabytes of data um, this way in you know a matter of hours, and I would say you know, like 18 hours or so, which is is really quite an achievement. Next slide, please. And uh, we're going to hand it over to Eddie to talk about the microfocus tools. Thanks, Craig. And uh, yeah, just as as you mentioned uh, earlier in the in your uh, um, presentation, what's really important when you start um, to to look at a move to uh, to the cloud is really understanding what actually underpins that application. And you know, this is part of the discovery process that Craig mentioned. And really before considering um, you know, that move, you really need to understand actually what the mainframe infrastructure consists of, how the applications are architected, uh, the complexity, uh, where the dependencies are between systems, et cetera. And, and really all too frequently, that knowledge is actually locked away in the years of experience of a few SMEs within your organization. So with Microfocus uh, Enterprise Analyzer, what this allows you to do is actually build a centralized facts-based um, repository. Um, now it's built from your application artifacts itself, uh, and these can be pulled in straight from uh, any sort of uh, SCCM system you've got running on the mainframe. It actually builds this repository automatically, and, and subsequently it can be made or maintained automatically on change. And it really then provides you with the application intelligence, you know, to look across the entire inventory, look at how actually applications actually relate, uh, look at the maintainability and complexity of those applications. It allows, allows you to start really understanding and documenting business processes uh, as, as part of those applications, and really to start to assess the impact of application-wide changes. Um, and you know we use it, and I know our study use it to actually understand um, the areas in the application that you need to actually change when moving that application and data to a new platform. Um, so it's kind of a portability uh, assessment uh, capability that it provides. So really, I think simply, you know, what Enterprise Analyzer provides is the what, the where, and the how of application chains, um, and it really allows you to make informed business decisions based on accurate knowledge about the systems uh, that make up your Mayframe inventory. Now, you know, when you're moving to a new platform, um, you you know whether it's actually to, to to move to that platform to get flexibility of where you deploy that application, whether it's part of a program to move away from the mainframe in its entirety, you still want to be able to actually, at the very least, build those applications, but more often than not, actually develop and modernize those applications. And you really need to be able to have modern development tools to be able to do that. Now, this is what main, uh, mainframe uh, enterprise developer is. It's a, it's a modern mainframe development environment uh, based on standard um, industry standard IDEs. Um, so we support Visual Studio uh, and we support Eclipse. And it allows mainframe developers to develop applications uh, in Azure in their own Windows-based development environment. Uh, and this means actually there's no conflicts and no resource contention um, with other developers or actually no reliance on the mainframe itself. And what it provides is most importantly full compatibility with the mainframe. So applications can be built and tested locally um, regardless of where they're going to be deployed. It could be you know, into production on Azure, it could actually be back onto the mainframe itself. Um, it provides modern development tools. Now, these are the tools that you know will be familiar and expected by new talent coming into the business. So, tools such as smart editing with background parsing, uh, local compilation, visual debugging, code analytics, uh, code standards checks. You know, a number of different capabilities that really sort of form that modern development capability that really plug straight into your uh, into your sort of development tool chain. Um, it actually provides the tools that you'll need to basically modernize the applications going forward. So once you've actually moved them into, into Azure, you then want to look at how you actually modernize them going forward, how they can actually remain 
are adding value to your to your business. So we provide the capabilities to actually integrate directly into managed co frameworks like .NET or or, or the or the JVM. Um, and importantly, actually provides very significant integration points, you know, either back to the mainframe or actually onto the existing tools that make up your DevOps tool chain within your Azure development environment. So it's very flexible in terms of how it actually integrates. And, and I think, you know, lots of customers are using this today to develop and maintain their, their mainframe applications. And, you know, they're seeing, you know, very significant improvements in how quickly they can develop those mm -hmm. applications. and uh, in terms of the quality of those applications that are being developed as well. Now, you know, critical to any sort of successful deployment onto an alternative platform is really how you manage your source control and, and, and configuration um, management process. Now, you know, working with, with lots of mainframe customers, you know, the, the SCCM environment that you have on the mainframe is really the backbone of how you deliver change into production on the host. Now, whether you're actually moving off the mainframe entirely or, or you plan to deploy applications to both Azure and the host, you need to be able to manage sources effectively on different platforms. Now, this is really where Enterprise Sync comes in, and it's an enterprise scale distributed SCCM environment that can be deployed onto the cloud. And it really actually, um, you know, like most distributed SCCMs, you know, really uh, allows you to actually support parallel development at scale, um, allows you to adopt agile practices, and importantly, actually provides modern tools for managing source uh, directly integrated into Enterprise Developer. But what really sets us apart, though, is its ability to be able to automatically synchronize source artifacts and the metadata related to those um, between the mainframe and the distributed environment. Now, why is that actually important? Well, if you're developing or if you're moving development to Azure um, uh, and you're accessing sources in the cloud, in a cloud-based SCCM environment, you ought to be sure that the changes that are made there are actually synchronized back to the mainframe and importantly vice versa and in this way you can actually ensure continuity of what you develop on, uh, and build on both platforms now even if you're actually moving off the mainframe to deploy exclusively in the cloud as you go through that migration process you know it's unlikely that those mainframe applications will remain static um, you know, you'll be making changes to the applications on the host as you go through that process. So if you can automatically synchronize both environments, then you're actually avoiding costly rework when you're about to cut over into production on a new platform. Now, lastly, you know, Enterprise Server, um, this really provides, you know, a flexible platform agnostic COBOL and PO1 application production environments. Uh, and this is really the, the, the technology that allows you to deploy mainframe applications into Linux, Windows, and Unix running in Azure. Now, we have hundreds of customers who actually trust MicroFocus today run their production systems, uh, really with the same level of reliability, availability, and serviceability they see on the host. And this is all without compromising security. Now, many customers have used Enterprise Server to realize you know, very significant cost savings, up to 90% in some cases, uh, when moving workload to alternative platforms. But more and more, what we're seeing is organizations who are really looking for the flexibility to get into new markets or geographical regions by repurposing those tried and trusted mainframe business systems to run on lower cost commodity platforms in the Azure cloud. So that's the technology, but you know, as, as we say in the UK, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. So let's take a look at this solution running in Azure. So John, over to you. Thank you, Eddie and Desiree. Uh, <clears throat> let me share my screen for everybody. And uh, <clears throat> where we'll start is where Eddie mentioned uh, we're going to run Enterprise Developer in the Visual Studio environment. Just as easily, we could have brought up Eclipse uh, as a tool, but I'm using uh, Visual Studio. We took a small little system, and uh, all I brought over into this environment for right now is the BMS screens and some COBOL source. So uh, here I have a menu in a BMS environment, BMS screen file. <clears throat> just like it looks on the mainframe. Here it is on uh, Enterprise Developer. Also, I have uh, Cobol Source. Let's bring up a Cobol Source file here. 
uh, it's just regular old COBOL. If I want to, if I'm working on it and I want to compile, I can just right click compile. And at the bottom here, it says succeeded. There's no errors. Let's say I made a change to a copy live that's used in a lot of sources. Well, I can right click the entire project and say rebuild. And it'll go through and scan all the BMS to make sure there's no errors. It'll then go through and compile all the COBOL. And as you can see, uh, it goes through very quickly. And I've now compiled all the COBOL, 26 items, and there's no errors. So uh, all the tools are here. I only show a, a couple of items uh, for, for sake of being brief. Uh, but Visual Studio is, is fully there. I can edit the BMS in a visual uh, mode or COBOL. I can step through the COBOL one line at a time if I want to uh, debug at a, a um, on the runtime system and see why my program isn't working correctly and make changes on the fly and, and just basically rerun. Then uh, the next step we do in migrating code is we'll take your, your database definition and bring over uh, <clears throat> into the uh, here is SQL Server running our little database that we have defined. Uh, I only have a few tables out here, and if I view uh, the top uh, 1,000 rows of my customer record, I see I have three customers uh, in my database. <coughs> and we're, we're, later on, we will do an update where we will update one of these with some data, and I'll show you uh, how it updated. But all this isn't possible unless you get into the Azure environment. The Azure environment uh, allows you to set up all the, the clouds. And the, here's the dashboard uh, where all the control of the Azure environment takes place. I am looking at, uh, first off, I'm going to look at the virtual machines. So here we set up an, a LegMod IBM demo machine. Uh, currently, it's running. It's not stopped. Uh, if I click on the LegMod IBM demo machine, it will show me uh, the details of the machine. Also, I can look at the charts to see uh, all the uh, performance issues, if there's any. Uh, I can add uh, widgets to this and look at different charts. Uh, also, I can see here that I am running a standard ES2 V3 level of a VM. So if I come over here to size and look for an E2S V2, you, I can see <coughs> uh, what that looks like. So if I come down here to a e, I'm sorry, E2S V3, I have a two CPU processor, 16 gigabytes, and the amount of disk. And my roughly cost of this machine is 167 a month. If I determine that this is not big enough or too big, as you can see, I can adjust it up to a 64 CPU machine. All I have to do is make sure there's no customers on here. I click on this, hit select at the bottom, and it will reboot the machine at that level running that, uh, that level of software. Uh, also, the you know if I want to go just a little bit larger for for CPUs uh, or even smaller, I can shut down uh, to 104 a month versus uh, down here further. Here's actually all the way down to one CPU, one gigabyte of memory for $11. So if I have a real small test machine that that I just want to do some testing on for one particular small system, very inexpensively I can fire up a machine. Uh, to run and, and, and do my testing. As soon as I'm done, I can take the same sources over to my production machine, and I'm off and running uh, without any changes. So that is the virtual machines. I also have uh, databases I can define. Databases are sort of the same as the virtual machines, where I can define the level of pricing and how much support I need. I am My pricing tier here is a basic 5 DTU. So if I wanted to, to see the other pricing tiers, I can click on the pricing tier and it will bring up uh, basic starting at 5 DTU. I can adjust it up. 
or I can switch to standard. You know, I can uh, flip flip uh, up up the scale here to lots of gigabytes in a standard environment, or change the DTU up to quite large, or I can go to a premium size. And as you notice, it has some starting costs here for you. So if you're not running fast enough with your database, it's very easy to reboot your database machine at the higher level. Also keep in mind that the load balancers are here. If I want to run uh, five online systems to service all my uh, online users, the load balancer will share the load amongst different machines, and they machines may be in different regions of the U.S., so uh, just going to spread it out. If one goes down, the other ones pick up the slack and, and continue working. And you have all the monitor tools and all the tools available for um, your Azure environment. <clears throat> Next, I'm going to actually show you the system running. So here we have a, <coughs> a enterprise server running in the remote desktop environment. So this is the Azure VM that I showed you is running at the, uh, the basic level. Uh, and here's the IP address. I'm logged into it, and it's running enterprise server. I can go in here and see all the different <coughs> modules, tools. It also has uh, performance here, listeners. Everything is built into the enterprise server. See your, your jobs running, your status of your jobs. Uh, start and stop your environment and have several environments running here. Also, I can bring up a uh, connect my 3270 into my box here. So if I just bring up, here's a, a piece of software, Rumba, that's running a 3270. <coughs> if I connect, there, here is, here is a, a menu program that's running my menu for my little tracking system that I have uh, converted over. And uh, I can just do an iCustomer and uh, bring up the first customer in the file. So if I want to go to the next customer, I, uh, I can just go to the next alphabetic, goes to the next one. So if I go inquiry back to my first one, and I want to modify it, I do a U customer. And do an update. Customer updated. Inquiry back to it. Yep, it's there. And uh, that shows that my customers are there. If I want to look at all the calls that are outstanding for all the customers, I just type in the trend code and uh, displays the different screens. To prove that it actually worked, if I come back here, uh, notice my contacts, second contact is all blank. Well, if I re-execute my top 100, here's my update I just put in. So that proves that my update to uh, the system actually updated my SQL Server database running in the cloud uh, using the, the screen emulation. And this look was, would look the same whether it's running here on the, in the cloud environment or running uh, on my real mainframe. And the user doesn't know the difference, really. So that uh, concludes the the demo of the actual system running. There's a lot to both the enterprise developer, enterprise server, and the uh, Azure environment. Uh, of course, I only touched on a very, very small portion of it. Very robust, and uh, you need you need to investigate it if this is of interest at all. Anyway, uh, that concludes my part of this, and I will turn this back to Desiree. Thank you, John. So now it's time for the Q&A portion of the presentation. We had a couple questions come in. So, um, so Ralph has a question for um, Eddie and Craig. He wants to know, what about the RPG programs? Eddie, would you like to address that? 
Yeah, we we don't actually have um, support for RPG programs um, within uh, the enterprise developer or enterprise server uh, environment. Um, typically, they'll be found on be found on on i series. Uh, uh, IBM environments, uh, and you know, if you're moving those to um, uh, to the cloud, then you'd be looking at either transforming those into another language or looking at a, 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 a you know a, a provider who can emanate RPG in that new platform. But we don't provide it as native support in enterprise, uh, an enterprise developer, enterprise server. All right, Mike has a question. He is wondering, what about the applications you mentioned ensuring high availability in Azure with IaaS VMs? Do you do any container technology? Yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, I know that you've been working on some container technology for COBOL, so I'll, I'll uh, have you answer that. Yeah, that's a good good question. Actually, um, this is an area that we're actually um, we're developing at the moment. Um, so we will have um, support for containers in our next release um, of Enterprise Server Enterprise Developer. Um, that'll be four zero, and that's due for GA in June this year. So a few months away. Um, but yes, we've invested in that. Um, so it's it's you know in terms of actually how customers are going to use that, uh, both from a production perspective, um, and I think that the development use cases are fairly straightforward. I, I can see that being very tightly integrated into enterprise developer, being able to actually um, have containers uh, to be able to actually test. Um, you know, as part of your continuous integration testing environment, um, how those um, applications will be deployed into containers in, in the cloud going forward. Um, we still need to look at some of the design patterns on how customers will, will actually deploy that. But yeah, support is going to be there in Forza. We're spending a lot of um, our development um, investment in, in getting capabilities um, or to, to allow um, uh, our tool sets to run in containers. And I think it's worth noting that. Microfocus spends more on COBOL research and development than anybody else in the world. In fact, they, they spend more on research and development than a lot of the other COBOL companies make in revenue. Yeah, thanks, Craig. <laughs> That's very <Yeah>. true. <laughs> so Alfredo has a question. He's wondering, is a mainframe move to Azure good for both batch and online workloads? And is cloud deployment inherently better for one of the one uh, of the other type of workloads? Yeah, I don't think it really matters whether it's batch or online. It does support both. Um, and uh, you know, we, we've got customers who have moved uh, a batch workload to distributed and find that uh, uh, batch windows that were taking hours on the mainframe once they move them to an open systems environment, uh, and again, depending on the types of processors that you put towards it, uh, will run in you know an hour or 30 minutes. Uh, that's not uncommon for that to happen. Um, and online works just as well. Um, it doesn't, doesn't matter whether it's batch or online, they're both suitable for cloud deployment. I don't know if you had anything to add to that, Eddie, or any other, any other uh, angle. No, I mean, I think that, that you know, I'd, I'd agree. I mean, I think the, the, the key thing there is is very often those things can't be decoupled. I mean, we have do have some customers with, with you know, pure batch systems that, that will, will, will bring that workload across. Uh, but in many cases, you've got batch and online systems working together. So you, you, you can't necessarily decouple those. But we will we'll support both, um, both, those, both those types of uh, application class. So. Wonderful. Um, so that concludes our Q&A because we are running a little bit tight on time. However, we did get a, a, quite a few questions come in. So if we had not addressed your question, may, please know that Craig and Eddie will be sending you an email response uh, addressing your question in, in the near future. Just wanted to highlight some, there is more information available if you're interested. We have an IBM mainframe to Azure reference architecture paper. 
you can find it on our cloud GPS tab of our website. Uh, and just go in there and then click on the leg legacy modernization tab. You should be able to find it. If not, uh, you will be. I will be sending a thank you email, and I will include the direct link to the reference architecture for you to download. Um, it is a wonderful paper, like uh, over 17 pages of information regarding this specific topic. Also wanted to highlight, we have some upcoming webinars that you may be interested in. We have both migrating IBM mainframe to Oracle Cloud, as well as migrating Unisys mainframe to Oracle Cloud. So please keep your eyes uh, open to that. We will be confirming dates and announcing those very soon. Um, like I said, if you have any other, if, if we did not address your specific topic on legacy modernization, we have a ton of material on our cloud GPS portion of our website, so feel free to go in and check it out. Last, but certainly not least, we have a wonderful special offer in store for you today, um, and Eddie's going to talk you talk to you about what we have in store for you. Yeah, thanks, Zuri. Now, this is a, a you know a, a thing we we you know both Microfocus and, and Astadia can offer, and and it really you know it's a service that we can we can provide to you sort of on a complementary basis, and really it it it's about really understanding um, you know what your business applications are doing, really understanding uh, how they fit together at the high level. Um, Really, sort of, you know, drilling into some of the the the, the, the technical details of those applications, um, and really understanding, you know, whether there's a good fit uh, to actually move that application across to uh, across to the Azure environment. Um, yeah, it's not a product pitch. It's not a, you know, we're not we're not, you know saying you have to go in a certain direction it's really sort of you know rolling our sleeves up and actually trying to understand your environment and actually making some recommendation you know with our experts and your experts you know in terms of of, of how you can take that application forward and as i say it's a complimentary offer and it really sort of allows you to start that journey in terms of understanding what options you've got and then how you can actually take um, you know take your first uh, steps in the journey to to the azure cloud so you know if you're interested in that then you know do contact the uh, the, the the guys at us at a stadia uh, and we can arrange that and get on site and actually start talking about how you can actually achieve this thank you eddie also wanted to let you know the webinar replay will be available on our website on Tuesday for you to download on demand. And if you're looking for more information specifically, please email info at estadia.com. This concludes today's webinar. We appreciate having Craig, Eddie, and John all share their knowledge on moving IBM mainframe workloads over to Azure. And most importantly, we appreciate you joining us today to learn more about this topic. We look forward to having you join us for the next webinar. Enjoy your day. Goodbye.